While you're busy relaxing on the weekend, entertaining, boating, stomping, and chomping, there's a whole fleet of people working in factories, pumping out everything from bacon to barbecues, so you can sit back and enjoy the weekend. The science of manufacturing these items has evolved over time. What are some of the technologies that go into making the goods? There's nothing better than hanging out with the guys on a summer weekend. Good food, fresh air, and a great pair of rubber boots for mucking around. Despite adding a few new colors, they don't look like they've changed much over the years. But actually, they have. What kinds of technologies make these boots lighter and more waterproof than ever before? The Kamek Boot Factory in Montreal has been making boots for over 100 years. Originally called Chiron Manufacturing, the company made leather footwear for women. Today, Kamek makes rubber boots for men, women, and children in all sorts of styles and colors. Our factory in Montreal started injection molding 40 years ago. And since then, we kept improving the process. Uh, we improved the materials, we improved the machines, we improved the molds, to make sure that once the boot is out on the market, it's flawless and it will perform as it was intended to. The first step in making rubber boots is making the polyester liner here with these knitting machines. It's the same machines they use to make pantyhose. Polyester is a synthetic fabric that first became popular in the 1950s due to how cheap and durable it is. Today, Kamek uses thread that is made from recycled water bottles. Each of these machines is loaded with seven spools of thread. Every machine has over 100 vertical needles and 100 horizontal needles that together knit and make the lining as a whole. A new liner is finished every 50 seconds. The machine runs at a speed of 450 RPMs, or revs per minute. Kamek has 24 of these machines, and they can each make 2,000 liners every day. And it serves a purpose of not having your foot um, like directly in contact with the rubber. It will become sticky. So if you don't have that permanent lining as a part of your boot, it will be difficult for you to extract the boot once you want to remove them. For the outside of the boot, Kamek uses a synthetic rubber. It's 100% uh, Kamek um, developed, and we're very proud of it. The fake rubber is made from rubber compounds and mixed with helium. It feels like natural rubber, but it's like between 35 and 50% lighter than real natural rubber. The boots start as pellets, which can be made into any color of the rainbow. To make these pellets into a boot, Kamek uses a process called injection molding. These pellets are sucked up from a hopper and heated until they melt into a liquid that is injected into a mold. Kamek has molds for every size and style of boot, but the basic principle is the same for all of them. This is an example of one of the molds. We have different components to each mold. There is the outsole, the shell, and the last. Uh, all of them combined together on the machine is what allows us to inject a boot. The last is shaped like a foot and leg, and it creates the form inside the boot. The outsole creates the bottom of the boot, and the shell forms the outside. On the factory floor, a worker puts the liners onto the last, and then the last is secured in place, and the mold comes down on top of it, ready for injection. One of the biggest advantages of the injection molding of footwear is that the process itself guarantees you a waterproof boot. The injection happens through a little hole in the mold here. Um, and as you can see, it becomes almost virtually invisible. The sole is injected first and then allowed to cool slightly. If the sole is too hot when the rubber for the upper is injected, the two parts will flow together, which ruins the look of the boot. But if the sole is too cool, the rubber from the upper will not bond to it. If any of those components are not perfectly matched, you'll have a boot that will delaminate. You can, with your hand, separate the sole from the upper. Computers monitor the temperature to make sure the rubber bonds properly, which is an improvement over the old methods. The first machines we used 
they were all manual machines. You needed to change a temperature or you needed to add pressure. You had to go behind the machine and crank a valve, you know, for half a turn or two and a half turns, see if the result is acceptable, go back and, and readjust. It was all based on trial and errors. With nine injection molding machines here in Montreal, Kama can produce three and a half million pairs of boots in a year. Enough boots for everyone in a city the size of Sydney, Australia. These computerized molds also monitor the pressure that seals the molds. 300 tons of force are exerted vertically on the mold and 150 tons horizontally, the equivalent of about 12 adult hippopotamus. Since the liquid rubber is being injected at 60 to 80 pounds per square inch, keeping the mold sealed is important to prevent hot liquefied rubber from escaping. But that's not the only challenge. So in the past, when you remove a boot, you had to pull on the heel and on the toe, and this would cause a stretch which would deform the boot and cause a reject. The solution was to split the last so the front half pushes the boot off and away from the heel, making it easier to remove. When the boots are removed from the molds, they're placed on a conveyor that takes them on a trip around the factory. The overhead conveyor goes around for 45 minutes. It allows the boot to cool even more before starting working on the finishing. After the boots have cooled, they're trimmed and finished based on their specifications. After the boots are finished, they are visually inspected and packed. But it's not over yet. Some are sent to be vigorously tested. Usually the standard for flexing is 50,000 flexes. Our standard was always a minimum of 100,000. Today, the standard is up now to a million. A million flexes without breaking down. We had to stop testing because, you know, after two, three millions, you're just wasting your time. There is absolutely no sign of wear and tear on this boot. So the invention of injection molding is what allows your feet to stay dry. And it's the invention of a machine that injects brine into your bacon that adds flavor to your That's weekend. Amazing. A big weekend breakfast isn't the same without a big slab of pea meal bacon. What technology makes it taste so good? Mm. Pea meal bacon was invented in Toronto in the 1870s. The meat was soaked in brine and rolled in crushed yellow peas. These days, we use cornmeal to coat the pork, but the name stuck, and the biggest name in pea meal bacon is Lou Albanese. And I've gone in the grocery stores and they're going, are you really Lou? I go, yeah, I'm really, honest to God. Look at my picture, look at me. That's Lou, and I'm Lou. <laughs> Lou's pea meal bacon starts with carefully selected pork loins. Pork loins are cut from the back of the animal. It's a lean cut of meat, carefully trimmed to remove most of the fat and the factory processes about 4,500 pork loins per day. The secret to tender, flavorful meat is in the brine, and that's the first step in the processing department. Preserving food with brine is an ancient practice. In its simplest form, brine is a mixture of salt and water. It softens the meat and kills off bacteria. It also adds flavor to the meat by adding different ingredients. It's got a nice little clove flavor, but beyond that, it's our secret. I can't tell you anymore. I'm sorry, I just can't. The loins are lined up in sets of five and go into the injection machine. Then the top secret brine mixture is pumped into the dual injector, where 300 needles inject it into the loins. It, it injects it twice. So any spot that we might miss, the second injection gets it all. Before injection brining, meats were just soaked in the liquid for long periods of time with the hope that enough would soak through the whole piece. To make sure each piece got enough brine, Lou had to buy an injector. This state-of-the-art piece of machinery has revolutionized Lou's output. Now the factory can brine up to 1,500 pork loins an hour. The brine loins drop into a hopper and are wheeled away to cure for 24 to 48 hours. We want the spices to go all through the meat and just make it delicious. After curing, the loins are taken to the wrapping area to be coated in cornmeal. In the days before refrigeration, 
The coating helped protect and preserve the meat, but it also adds a bit of flavor. Each loin is coated by hand. This is one area where automation just isn't up to the job. We've tried all kinds of things, but it just gets more even on the product when we do it by hand. The coated loins are tightly wrapped in cling film to keep the coating on and the juices inside. Then they're taken away to be flash frozen. This makes the loins firmer, so they're easier to cut. After the injector, the Mega Slicer was the second piece of technology that helped make Lou's the biggest supplier of pea meal bacon in Canada. So it revolutionized how, how quickly and how much pea meal we can pack at one time. Before buying the slicer, they cut each piece of pea meal bacon by hand. But now, the slicer cuts up to 250 slices of bacon in a minute. The freshly sliced pea meal bacon is weighed and wrapped in Lou's innovative packaging. They wrap 12,000 packs of bacon per day. That's 120,000 slices of bacon, which could make around 40,000 sandwiches. The packs of bacon are boxed and sealed, ready to be shipped out for your breakfast feast. So next time you're cooking bacon on the weekend, remember Lou's super slicing machine. And there's another state-of-the-art slicer that's responsible for making your gas barbecue. If there's one piece of gear for weekend fun you can't live without, it's your barbecue. Awesome. Look at this lunch that's ready. And this age-old way of cooking has changed over time. In 1952, a welder discovered that by cutting a metal buoy in half and adding charcoal, fire, and a grill, it was the perfect way to cook outdoors. The backyard barbecue was born and soon became synonymous with summer. Fast forward, and now we have this the state-of-the-art gas barbecue. Napoleon pumps out thousands a year. I think the gas barbecue has really revolutionized the, the whole outdoor living aspect because it is so quick and so easy to be able to go out to your grill, turn the knob, hit the button, the grill comes on, and in a matter of minutes, you're ready to cook. And these fancy barbecues all start with four by eight foot sheets of steel, each weighing 65 pounds. Napoleon goes through nine and a half million pounds of steel in a year, the same amount of steel that could make about 5,300 cars. Each one of those barbecues consumes about three sheets of steel. Napoleon uses a lot of stainless steel in its barbecues to prevent rust. All of the portions that are exposed to heat are stainless steel. Stainless steel is a metal that resists corrosion making it perfect for an appliance that sits outside and is exposed to high heats. Now it's time to cut the steel into pieces that will become different parts of the barbecue. And it's the invention of laser cutting technology that allows so many barbecues to be built so quickly. The steel sheets are loaded one by one into a state-of-the-art laser cutter. This is a 3,000 watt fiber optic Prima laser. Uh, in layman's terms, it's a very sharp instrument. In laser cutting, a beam of light is tightly focused onto the metal, melting it quickly and precisely. You don't see the light because it's outside of the visible spectrum of, of light that we can see. However, we do see the sparks that it creates, and that's fun to watch. Albert Einstein came up with the theory behind lasers way back in 1917, but it wasn't until the 1960s when scientists figured out how to create and use them. Now lasers are everywhere, from kids' toys to scanning barcodes at supermarkets. After the steel is cut by the laser, it goes here to the robotic bending press that shapes it into part of the barbecue. The press can put up to 80 tons of pressure on each piece of steel. That's equal to the weight of 16 full-grown elephants. I like watching the automated bending machines. Seeing the piece of steel go from the flat, get moved into the bender, and see the bender take over from there and do all the different breaks on it, and then see that part come out the other side, completely formed and ready to go on the grill. Before becoming automated, Napoleon workers had to do this task using hydraulic presses. It took two workers to load and operate. 
But now, with the robotic press, a computer does all the work. Napoleon's output has increased by around 40% since acquiring these presses. We've used technology to cut it and bend it, but now the only technology that can do the rest is people power. There's a lot of intricate parts that you have to put together. You gotta make sure that all the connections are right so that you don't have any fires or any problems for the customer. The control panel is attached carefully to the firebox, since this is where the gas lines are hooked up. The most important step in the making of a barbecue is the testing of a barbecue. Each and every firebox is tested. Testing is very important since natural gas becomes flammable when mixed with air. Once it passes the test, the firebox is connected to the base and the lid, and it's boxed up and ready to go. Figuring out how to cut and bend a cumbersome material like stainless steel is the key to making barbecues faster and cheaper. But how does technology shape a tough material like fiberglass so that the boat floats on the weekend? For many of us, being out on the water is when the weekend starts. Whipping around the lake in the latest speedboat is possible because of modern fiberglass technology. Campion Marine in Kelowna, British Columbia has been in the boat making business since 1974. 40 years ago, a typical boat was mostly made out of wood. They're extremely high maintenance. Often they leak. Often they require a lot of day-to-day -day care, whereas the fiberglass boat gives you a much simpler boat, very strong product. Back in the early 60s, fiberglass was really a revolutionary product, and many things started being made out of it. Bathtubs, Corvettes, all sorts of things. On a matched weight test, fiberglass is stronger than steel. Its durability and lightness, as well as the fact that it can be easily shaped in a mold, makes it the perfect material for a boat. What a lot of people don't realize is a boat is actually built from the outside to the inside. All of the parts to a fiberglass boat begin as an empty mold. The hull, deck, and all the smaller parts each have their own mold. But before any of the boat building can begin, the molds are waxed. Very important to put this wax on properly because if you don't, you won't get the part to release from the mold. To make sure no part is missed, Campion requires eight layers of wax to be put on by hand. Since the boat is being built from the outside in, the first step to the process is taping the design onto the mold. Campion Marine's champion taper, Jeff, marks off the boat's design with masking tape. I do everything inside out. So I gotta do everything, I gotta do everything backwards. Each boat has its own design. A very intricate method is used. Normally it's done with very precise measurements, but in this case, Jeff has been doing it for a very long time and is one of the only people who can do it freehand. When the design has been taped off, the gel coat is applied. This is the actual outside surface of the boat. To give it some rigidity, a coat of fiberglass called the skin coat is sprayed on afterwards. The skin coat on this boat is put on with isothalic resin. That guards against blistering, and we embed that right into the gel coat. For extra strength along the keel, a strip of Kevlar is applied. And the idea of putting it down the keel is, if you are going to impale something in the water, chances are it's gonna be down the keel. The fiberglass is applied using a chopper gun. A bundle of glass fibers is drawn into the gun by a rubber roller. A set of blades cuts the fibers into inch-long pieces and sprays them with a special resin onto the mold. The resin makes the fibers of the glass stick together and hardens it all into a solid object. Next, a layer of tightly woven fabric is laid onto the hull for extra strength and to hold the hull of the boat together. Chop is sprayed on over the fabric, and then workers smooth the layers to press the fibers down. Once the whole hull has its layers of fiberglass, it's left to cure for 24 hours. Then the hull is ready for the stringer, another piece that's like the skeleton of the boat. The stringer is uh, the longitudinal that runs down the length of the hull to give it some stiffness and the bulkheads that run across the, the beam of the boat. The stringer also holds any of the interior workings of the boat, like fuel tanks or inboard engines. 
It is secured with a chemical adhesive called methylmethalacine. It's kind of like welding fiberglass. It's a glue which we apply to one surface and we push down the next part into this surface. And it'll soften the fiberglass and resin together and just kind of melt everything together. After the stringer is secure, the hole can be removed from its mold. This is a quality control check. We're checking for air voids. Make sure there's no flaws in our lamination process. Once the hull passes inspection, it goes to the assembly department. This is where the hull and the deck come together to form a complete boat. The deck that we have here is upside down. Um, every one of our models goes through the same stage. We have our wiring harness that is installed. The wires are for the stereo system, the lights, and the dashboard. The deck is lifted and flipped with pulleys, and the hull is moved under it. The Elante 505 has an outboard motor, which will go here on the transom. So there has to be a strong bond between the deck and the hull to support it. 20 years ago, we used nothing but rivets to bond the deck to the hull. The problem with that is the water would actually get into the boat. So now we use a product called methacrylate. And what that does is, is it does seal the gap between the deck and the hull, bonds it so it's a strong, tight finish, and also will not allow water to penetrate through and seep into the boat. The next step is the upholstery, which is manufactured right on site at Campion. Once finished, it's added to the boats by hand. After all the parts are attached to the boat, it's ready to be shipped off to happy boaters anywhere. Boating is just absolutely wonderful because what do you do? You do it with your family and your friends. So you're out there just to have a good time. And having a good time on the weekends is what we all live for. Thanks to the latest technological advances in manufacturing, our weekends are that much more fun. <laughs>